Well, good morning, Tabor College. Uh, welcome back. Can we have the lights up so I can see who I'm talking to here? Uh, I'd like to make eye contact. Thank you. Thank you very much. So some of you are back, and this is your senior year, and this is the final semester, and then you're out of here into the wide world. Some of you just found us, and this is your first semester. So welcome to you and all of you who are here. Thank you for coming. So you see up here, <clears throat> there's this green building that you see on the south end of campus that when you walk through the center you see all the time. That's going to be the Welcome Center. On the first floor is going to be Enrollment Management, and on the second floor is going to be the Advancement Offices and the President's Office. Today from 11.30 to 1 o'clock, you are all invited to the building, and you will be giving some pens and writing instruments. You'll be able to write notes and different kinds of things that you want on the floor, on the studs, on the wood, on the walls, wherever you would like to say something. Keep in mind the people are going to be coming in. Uh, there's going to be our guests there. It's a grand entrance for the campus. The officers are going to be there for a number of people, and you'll be able to just put encouraging notes and words there. I can tell you what I'm going to write on there, and that is where my office is, where my desk is going to be. I'm going to write right where the desk is, Isaiah 30, 21, and Proverbs 16, 9. Those are two verses that were given to me the first day that uh, I came and began serving at Tabor College, and they've been kind of the foundation of all that I do as, as a president. And so I'm going to put that there, then they're going to cover it up with carpet, and all the things that you write will be covered up, but they'll still will have been there. And they still will continue to be there. And then I'll put my desk over it, and I will always know that the foundation of those two scriptures are right there where I do a lot of work. And then when I pass the baton to whoever is next, I'm going to tell them that. That where you sit, there's a couple Bible verses right underneath you. And they are there for your foundation. So I encourage you to, during that time, go there. There will be, go out through the, the gym door entrance, and you can walk in there, and you'll be able to uh, add your words to the building. I would like to ask you to join me as we pray again, because the things that I want to share this morning could just be painful for some of you. And they could bring great joy for some of you. And above all, I hope they bring hope for all of you. So would you join me as I pray? Lord Jesus, you know the words that uh, I'm going to be sharing. And you know who needs to hear them and how they need to impact our lives. I pray, Father, that your spirit would be present, would take the words and wing them into the hearts of each of us. May the truth that I will be sharing, may that truth bring hope and healing and a new joy. And where there's pain, I pray, Father, that you would surround that with yourself. And where there's joy, that you would encourage it. Would you and your spirit ignite what you want to do in each of our lives? In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk to you this morning about a concept that I call sovereign foundations. A sovereign foundation are those things in your life which you have absolutely no control over. You have no control over that they happen to you. So, for example, none of us chose where we were born. <clears throat> we, some of us were born on a farm. Some of us were born in a city. Whatever country you happen to be born of, none of us chose where we were born. We didn't choose what kind of occupation our parents would be in. Some of us lived in a, a setting where we had two parents, a mom and a dad. Some of you lived in a, a single parent setting. Some of you had a step parent from the very beginning. Some of you had an absent parent and they weren't around. 
Some might have had a mother that was uh, addicted to some drug or you had a dad that walked out. Or maybe you were part of a military family and every two years you moved. There's nothing you could do about any of those and some of those are painful, some are not painful, but you didn't have any control over them. Some of you probably maybe were adopted. When you were born, your mother said, the best thing I can do for this child is give them to somebody who will provide a good home for them. You had no choice about your nationality or the language that you spoke in your home. You had nothing to do with these things. So for example, I was born in a farm family in South Dakota in a Hutterite culture. Now that means absolutely nothing to you. But it's very important to me and it's very important in how it shaped who I am and how I live life. I grew up where the closest neighbor was almost a mile away. And some of you were born where there were thousands of people around you just outside your door or maybe even next door and you even shared walls together. In the home that I grew up, we spoke two languages fluently, Hutrish, which is a dialect of Low German, which is a dialect of German. So it's kind of like a real hard Southern twang in English with a little bit extra added to it but it was in the German and we spoke that and if you wanted to know what mom and dad were talking about, you had to understand that. And then we spoke English as well. I lived in a place where I was on the edge of, there was a lot of Mennonites and we worked in that, but then when I went to school, I was the only Mennonite boy, the only Hutterite boy in the entire school. I didn't have any control over that. It just happened. Our family of origin. How many siblings you had in your family. You didn't get to choose that. Or if you're the firstborn or the only born or if you were born into a tribe. Or maybe you had siblings that were a lot older than you and they just smothered you with care. Or maybe you had siblings that were younger than you and you cared for them. Or maybe you had a, a brother or a sister that had a lot of special needs and that was central to how your family functioned. Or maybe you had some brothers or sisters that really made some bad choices. And they were just embarrassing choices and the family was dishonored by them. Or maybe it didn't even care. Maybe, you know, and you watched People in your family do things that were very harmful to them. Or maybe there were all kinds of family dynamics that were there in your family life. How your family treated you. Some of you, your, your parents gave you absolutely everything. You had a hot car to drive brand new when you were age 16. And you played in well manicured fields and in beautiful gymnasiums from little on. And, it was, and your mom and dad were at every event and they were always there rooting you on. And others of you lived on the street and you played in a dirt lot. And some of you came home to milk and cookies every day after school and others of you came home to an empty house and no one there. For some of you, your dad was the only one that had a job in the family and took care of the family. And for others, your mom had three, four jobs just to make ends meet. Some of you moved many times and other of you, others of you lived in the same house your entire life. Some of you had a lot of discipline and a lot of structure and others of you, you could just do anything you wanted to anytime and no one cared. Some of you lived in poverty some of you lived in extreme comfort. Some of you maybe grew up poor. It wasn't really poverty, but it was poor. And some of you were in generational poverty, and there was a cycle of it there. Or maybe you were like me. I grew up in a poor family and didn't know it. When I look back, I remember one year, I wore the same pair of brown corduroy pants every day to school all year long. And every Saturday, my mom would take those pants and she'd wash them and she'd dye them brown. And then I'd have like a brand new pair of pants every Monday morning for 29 cents. 
We didn't have any money, but we never knew that we were poor. When I would fall and tear my pants, and that would seemingly be often, she would patch them. But she wouldn't patch them so you could see it. She found this patch which you slipped in underneath and then you ironed it and then the, it all stood to it and then she trimmed off the fringes so you could hardly see that there was a tear. When I moved into the Tabor dorm and she was unpacking my stuff for me, she all of a sudden stopped, looked at me and she said, Jules, this room is nicer than what you've had at home. And it was in the, the men's quad. I remember in health class in grade school when they were teaching us personal hygiene and the teacher asked a question, how many times should you brush your teeth? And I quickly raised my hand because I knew this one. And I said, two times a year, every time before you go to the dentist. We, I mean, I thought that's what it was. And everybody kind of snickered and laughed and I thought, what? And they said, oh, it's supposed to be every day, two times a day, morning and night. And I go, no one told me. I didn't know that. That I had no control over that. That's just the area in which I lived. Some of you have families that divorce has been a part of it. And you have multiple moms and multiple dads, or maybe you have something you don't want to see or... Uh, many of you had parents that were divorced, and some of you maybe had parents that are in prison, or you had parents that had been abusive, or an alcoholic parent, or you've been assaulted, or you've been abused, and you had no control over that happening. I grew up in a family where there was lots of anger, a lot of anger. Now, I was never physically abused. There was no hitting or slapping or pushing. It was just a quick temper, many demands, lots of yelling, and just an angry place. Some of you have experienced some loss. You lost a sibling, a brother or a sister, or a close friend, or a parent. Or maybe you witnessed a crime. You just happened to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, and you saw someone's life being taken, or someone's attempted life being taken, and or there's this memory that just sticks in your mind. Or, or maybe you were in an accident of some kind. Or maybe you had all kinds of different experiences. I have a friend who, as a little boy, he was in the, I think there was eight in his family. And they were taking a vacation and uh, they stopped for gas. And he went into the restroom. When he came out, his family was gone. And he had been left. And they hadn't counted when they all got back into the car and took off and he was alone, and so they finally came back and got him. But that hung with him. When I knew him, he was 30 years old already, and he was still remembering that. He had no control over the fact that it had happened. Or maybe there are special relationships that you remember. My grandmother lived with us for the first 11 years of my life, and it had a huge impact on me. I didn't control that. I didn't decide that my parents would bring my grandma in to live with them when her husband died. But it had an impact on me. Or what your gender is, if you're male or female, you, you didn't get to choose that at your birth. You had no control over these. Make your own list. All of these things are sovereign foundations. You had no control over them, and they were a part of your life. So here's the question. What are you going to do about them? Are you going to get angry about some of the things that happened and let that anger continue to push? Are you going to blame people for it? Oh, if they only wouldn't have done it differently. Are you going to compare yourself to somebody else that didn't have it? Oh, it's just not fair. Are you going to see yourself as a victim and for the rest of your life see yourself as a victim? A lot of these things are painful. And often they're not fair. 
And you can ask yourself, why me? But you see, you do not have a choice in them, but you do have a choice in how you respond to them. Don't compare. Life is not fair. All of these are a gift from God. All of your sovereign foundations are a gift from the good hand of God. You do not have a choice with them, but you do have a choice in how you respond. And how you respond can move you in the direction that you need to go. Your choice can either be that you will get bitter or you will see these things as a gift from the hand of God and you will see these things as God shaping your life so you can participate in his grand mission in the world as you seek that out. <clears throat> All of these sovereign foundations have an important part of who you are so that you can participate in his grand mission. This past week, I attended the funeral in Enid, Oklahoma. <clears throat> the wife of a former board, merit, board member emeritus who had put his personal wealth on the line many years ago to keep Tabor open uh, died and we went to her funeral. As I'm walking into the church, I suddenly have a flashback from 1985. You see, in 1982, Peg and I packed our three children and everything we owned into a Ryder truck, into a Mercury Zephyr station wagon, and we took off from Ulysses, Kansas to Houston, Texas to start churches. And about two and a half years later, we met with the group to assess what was going on with the church and, and, and the progress or lack of it that was there. And the group said to me, we're not going to support you anymore. And they gave me my pink slip. I was fired. That event 